you had a 1% chance of survival rate. I was there when the car accident happened, but I don't remember because the injuries I suffered was horrendous. The nearest hospital was like nearly 40 minutes away. And I was supposed to die within three to five minutes. Do you think that you need to hit a rock bottom? Growing up in poverty just seemed normal to me, like lack of food in the refrigerator, cabinets. But ultimately, everyone has a choice to become a victim or a victor. Was there a specific moment where you knew that this was what you were being called for? The reality is that we live on earth together, so we should be working together. When we work together, we achieve more together. All you have to do is connect with someone who's over overcame that void that you have now. So that person has the blueprint and they're willing to guide you through it. My conversation today is with a man named Ethan Poetic. He was raised in unfavorable, undesirable circumstances, single family home, struggling to keep food in the fridge. And he suffered a near fatal car accident where he had a 1% chance of survival rate and was supposed to be dead in three to five minutes. Against all odds, he is living, he is breathing, he went on to earn two college degrees, he is now a motivational speaker, an advocate for mental health, and a life coach. And he also authored his very own book. I hope you enjoy this interview with Ethan Poetic. Ethan, thank you for being here today. And when I say that to you, I feel like it holds a much stronger meaning because statistically, you should no longer be living. Is that correct? That is true. That's a mathematical equation. Could you share a bit about your personal journey and the challenges that you've been able to overcome? I grew up in a single parent household. I had a strange relationship with my father in a lot trials and tribulations with people being involved with drugs, alcoholism, and not really taking care of their own mental health on a priority level. So many times people just go about life just collecting excess baggage and then when they get into a relationship, they carry the excess baggage into the relationship. And some people ignore those red flags. And when you ignore the red flags, uh, they start to add up. And when they add up, that's what's causing people to be more in rebounding relationships instead of a thriving relationships. What are some red flags that you ignored? Uh, growing up, it seemed normal that, how I say this? It seemed normal to like have siblings live in a different household compared to the ones I live with. It seemed normal to just not see a certain person for long periods of time. And then when I grew up, I realized that's a lot of time missed out on spending time with someone like my sister. She lives like an hour away from me during that time period. But I would always see my brother who would live with her. Then there's also just seeing signs of alcoholism, like someone having too much to drink. I thought someone's just having a good time, but I realized some people just self-medicate. Okay, so when you see people drinking alcohol too much, it's a red flag for you, which means what? You want to avoid them? No, it's not that I avoid them. It's just I see something different. Because everyone has a different level of tolerance intake. It's just a matter of how does a person act when they're fully intoxicated? Do they plan on doing this at their house or in the bar or who's their uh, designated driver. Because too many times I see people end up in situations they're not supposed to be in, like, you know, unfortunately, vehicular manslaughter, charged with a DUI, because a person loses judgment while doing that. But I also realize when a person doesn't take care of their mental health, they turn to other things, which are like a temporary substitute. It sounds like you grew up around that a lot. You saw that a lot. How did that influence you? And how does that impact your life now? When I saw it, it was more of a situation like it became too normal until I saw the cause and effects of certain people ending up in jail. 
and I just wanted to do it differently. And I just didn't want to go down that path. Now it's just more, if I see someone in those type of problems, you know, there's a, there's a difference between, I can offer some resources for like rehab, like, you know, inpatient or outpatient therapy, like to an organization or refer them to a church or refer them to a person who has overcome their own drug and alcoholism problem. Well, to me, it's up to the person at an individual level to do the work themselves because no one could do the work for them. Yes, 100%. You became an advocate for mental health and personal development. Was there a specific moment that you remember where you knew that this was what you were being called for? Yeah, it's, it's a series of like events. Like for example, my friend who I'm still friends with now, during that time period, I got invited to speak at his school, Lancaster Country Day, about poetry because the teacher didn't want to just teach out of a, a book. She wanted to bring someone who had that essence and that experience and was living it. And I was able to show kids that you can create your own story, your own narrative, and write in your own ways while keeping the basis of spoken word and eventually, when I got done, I started a good turnout. I realized I could do this as a keynote speaker. I could do this as a poetry workshop. And a lot of people like talk therapy, kind of like some people like to talk things out when they're at the salon or barber shop or any other place where there's, you know, a nice environment for people to express themselves. That was one key moment. The other key moments is just starting my own business in the summer of 2021. This one guy. Encouraged me to start because I always wanted to start a business. And, you know, it's just everything just came in full circle where he was able to get me connected to a photographer. And then I ended up telling my plan to this guy who I know for several years. And it just so happens his wife specializes in helping people start their LLCs. Then this other guy I got referred to, he does website designs and website support. And then I was able to make my business cards digitize my logo, create my mission statements, business plan. And eventually it led to me being a self-published author. My book is called The Chronicle, The uh, Inspirational Story of Ethan A. Poetic, Chronicles of Adversities, Education, Sports, Relationships, and Resiliency. I got eight forewords, two back cover reviews. It's available as a soft cover, hard cover, ebook on all major platforms or people buy from me directly. Either contact me on social media or my website, ethanspeaks.com for like an autograph copy. And because it turns into memorabilia over time, which increases the value of the book and longevity. I'm almost done the audio version of my book. And that was a trial and error, but I'm finally right across the finish line. Amazing. Is your last name actually literally poetic? Yes. Uh, long story short, um, not that I'm like Malcolm X or Muhammad Ali. It's just I started doing research on my family history, and I realized that last name that I used to have, Vaughn, didn't belong to me. It belonged to the German slave masters who bought my African ancestors. And I realized since my legacy is becoming greater, and I'm getting all these recognitions and awards, and acknowledgements, I might as well do it under a name that, that's, that I can claim as my own. And I legally changed it to Poetic. It was approved by the Lancashire County Courthouse summer of 2021. The same process I was going with starting up my business. It was just a change of being more authentic. Uh, also having a lasting alliance with my purpose. And it's something that I hold true to myself. And, you know, uh, luckily I got the blessing from my grandma before she passed away. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, because I saw you host poetry workshops. So mm -hmm. for your last name to be poetic and you're also an author, like you said, and a motivational speaker. How do you use these different modalities to convey messages related to personal health or to mental health and personal growth? Like when it comes to speaking in the schools, uh, like one example could be a school want me to speak on how can we encourage these kids 
not to bully each other. But we have to look at the root issues. Like uh, sometimes it comes from someone looking to have their ego stroked. Someone's trying to look down on somebody who may not be financially secure with food, housing, clothing. When the reality is that we live on earth together, so we should be working together. Because when we work together, we achieve more together. Another thing could be about Black History Month coming up from February. We talk about our history and speak to the speak about the leaders like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King, and many others who overcame their own personal hardships and struggles to become the person they are and leave a lasting legacy. Then there's also having people understanding that you don't have to turn to drugs or alcoholism to fulfill a void in your life when the reality is that all you have to do is connect with someone who's over overcame that void that you have now. So that person has the blueprint and they're willing to guide you through it. Now, when it comes to the poetry workshop, as I said, again, it's a matter of just allowing the kids to speak their own truths. Because people who come from wealth have their own struggles they have to talk about. Like they have to be careful about who's in their inner circle, who they allow in their house, because not everyone who's there for a good time is actually good with coming there with good intentions. Mm. And it's just the reality of that. Then there's also a situation where you have to be really mindful that once you gain wealth and assets, you have to maintain it and set up in a way to where it can get passed down to the next generation. We have to train up the next generation so that they can acquire it as a whole and learn the financial literacy part. Uh, it's just a matter of just taking one situation at a time. That's all. One hour at a time as well. So you speak on everything from bullying to how to manage wealth for the next generation. Yes. Because when it comes to bullying, somebody's looking for attention and they're usually crying out for help. But that's not the right way to cry out for help because the right way to, to ask for help is, you know, go to your guidance counselor, your teacher. Because if you keep bullying your student, your uh, classmate, eventually that person's being victimized and it's costing them their self-esteem, self-worth, and dignity. And eventually once a parent finds out, uh, that's when the principal finds out, the teacher finds out, and eventually there's going to be a meeting. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things to do to prevent all that. Because eventually, if you keep allowing bullying inside the school, create a toxic environment by preventing bullying and offering solutions and allowing people to understand that this will not be tolerated, here's the consequences of this, that puts a lot of people in check. It allows people who were bullied to heal. Those who want to bully can communicate much differently on what's going on with them. Because the person who likes to victimize people usually has the most underlying pain that's unresolved. Yes. Yes. It's so interesting that we're talking about this right now. I didn't think we were going to be going here. But uh, yesterday, I literally had a couple memories pop up of when I was bullied as a child. And I was reflecting on it thinking, Hmm, like, I wonder where that was coming from for them. Like, I wonder how I triggered them or what it was about me that caused that to happen. And I think it does begin in the house, right? It begins how you're raised. Yeah, because normally, you know, it depends on this. I'll say this. There's no blueprint on parenting, but there's plenty of lessons to learn from other people's parenting. But unfortunately, some people who become parents are not, uh, how I say this, sufficiently able to become parents, whether it's financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically, lack of words of affirmations. But I also remember this book called The Five Love Languages from Gary, Dr. Gary Chapman, where he speaks on people like to be loved in different ways. 
And and out of those five love languages, it's best to, for a person to identify how they want to be loved because we have to be have an open line of communication instead of thinking as adults, we don't have to listen to these kids because 50 to 70% of the parenting is already completed just by listening to the kid. Whether it's verbally, sign language, text, email, verbally, or written, we just have to be able to have that open line of communication, understand how this child feels or children feels so that we as adults can facilitate the best solutions possible. But it takes a person willing to be humble themselves because a parent, they sometimes think it's a dictatorship, but that's not how parenting is supposed to be. Parenting is about loving your child, being present for your child, and having a vision and understanding what your child's gifts are. Now, there is a time for tough love. There's a time to allow a child to learn from failure. But ultimately, as parents, we uh, I'll say for some people who are parents, they have to be willing to have a mentor. That way they can learn from someone who's already on through the road of parenting. And they can always reflect on, did they make the right decision now? Or do they need to make it up later? Because sometimes some people are on a bad streak of making bad decisions with their children. But if they catch it in time, they can recover and be forgiven. Because I've seen some situations where some parents live in denial of harming their children, neglecting their children, until the child speaks out. And it's like they didn't hear these words before. But it's not that they didn't hear it. It's just that they didn't take it serious. They didn't put away the distractions. Because normally back in the day, people used to have lunch and dinner and breakfast at the table. And that's when everyone had a say at the table. Uh, nowadays, it's not like that as much anymore. But at the same time, we have to listen to the youth because they are the future. Mm -hmm. Going back to parenting and how impactful that is, you were raised in a single parent home, correct? Yes. How did that affect your upbringing and who you are today? Uh, growing up in poverty just seemed normal to me, like lack of food in the refrigerator, cabinets. Uh, there was a time period where we were not living in poverty because, let's see, my mom had my bro older brother, I think, either after high school or a year after high school. And then I was born several years later. Then somewhere between two to three years later, my mom is with another person and they have two kids and they were living together such as cohabitation. That seemed normal to me because here's a male figure more involved in my life than my own dad. It, just, it felt like somebody's my dad, but I knew he wasn't. But eventually all that cohabitation adds up because a person's usually given the benefits of a wife and a husband without, you know, a marriage license. And eventually, one day, you know, as things added up, he left. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Packed up his bags and left. And that became the beginning of more struggles in the household. While at the same time, when you have kids with somebody, you still got to co-parent together. Um, for me, personally, moving forward, I could tell kids that co-parenting is not the way to go because it has consequences. Because if you bring a child into this world and you're just living together, you got to take several steps back and ask yourself, what can we do to make this co-parenting work? Because eventually, you know, a child's name gets attached to those things and they haven't even achieved anything. A child's names are attached to those things based on stories that other adults are going to talk about from the outside looking in. And eventually, for me, it's a matter of just breaking the cycle of identifying like certain things not to do versus some things to do. Like, for example, I grew up in a single parent household of five. When I became a teenager, I got invited to visit the Amish and Mennonites in their homes. I saw certain family households where a guy had 10 kids by one woman, but they didn't depend on the government for no welfare, insurance, or any type of benefits. 
And what it came down to between that reality and my reality is that the reality is that they have more of a structure where everyone in the community succeeds making 25 plus dollars an hour doing manual labor or trades versus my mom, the community was not as strong versus that. And it's also a matter of just understanding like what type of life was she going through prior to I was being born? but also understand what type of life my dad was going through prior to me being born. But ultimately, everyone has a choice to become a victim or a victor. Yes. So how can we help more people make the choice to be a victor rather than a victim? We have to lead by example in our walk. We have to lead by example in being productive. And that does include humility where someone can say, I used to do these bad things but I want to put these behind me and start a new path. And you got, it's more than just speaking it. It's more about living it daily. Like for example, someone might have a struggle with watching certain things on the internet. Well, let's safeguard the internet. Someone might have a problem with overeating, which is a, which is a form of gluttony. But in order to, uh, let's see, counter that, let's look at the root of what triggers somebody to do certain things. And that takes an honest conversation where you got to put away your cell phones, all electronics, and have this heart-to-heart conversation with someone who's really to tell you what you need to hear. Because ultimately, you know, all these things that we go through in life have already been overcame. Whether it's injuries, mental health, sickness, mental health illness. Because I realize when a person goes through depression, it's normal to have it in a way because death is going to happen. Bad news is going to happen. But eventually we have to understand that some of those things are just for a certain time period, like a day, a week, maybe even a season, because sometimes we go through survivor's remorse when someone that's near and dear leaves this earth mm-hmm. and that's something we have to understand on a core level that no one's going to live on earth forever so eventually we're going to leave and, and the memories that we leave behind are going to be with people whether it's for better or worse and as far as we come in going from victim to victor you have to want it uh, like, for example, I remember this movie. It was a Christian-based movie. I forgot. I think it was called Fireproof. And the coach told his best player, I want you to do the bear claw, the bear claw walk on all fours, hands and knee, hands and feet, crawling up to the 50-yard line. But he wanted him to do it with somebody on his back. So, but the, the key thing is he blindfolded him and he wanted him to go as far as he could. And the coach kept encouraging him to keep going and going, even when the struggle was going. The kid had already passed the 50 yard line, but the coach was still pushing him to keep going. But the player who was blindfolded didn't know. It wasn't until he landed on the other side of the end zone where he gave it all and broke down. And he, the coach told him, Take off your blindfold, you're in the end zone. That's how it is in life. We have to give it our all. That's how we're going to experience a breakthrough. That's how we're going to change and transform into a better versions of ourselves and evolve because it's part of doing the work that requires accountability. It requires be, be willing to participate in a, in a healing process. Like, if you want to get healed by a doctor, you got to tell the person where you're hurting, whether it's mentally, physically, or emotionally, or however. And then we can, now that the situation's been diagnosed properly, now we can work on the journey of regaining your life back together and your freedom as well. Mm. Do you think that you need to hit a rock bottom to get to that place? Yes, there's some people who actually do hit rock bottom, like people who are on drugs. Like, for example, 
There's a show on A and E where it documents people who are on drugs and alcoholism. And, you know, those people are not working, but yet they have money somehow to get this stuff. They have access to a cell phone to contact somebody. Usually when a person's involved in addiction, there's somebody or some group of people that's enabling them. And eventually, you know, a reality check happens, you know, after you keep overdosing and someone has to uh, inject the norkine in you. Because when a person's under the influence of drugs or alcoholism in the public eye, that's considered public intoxication, <laughs> which is a misdemeanor offense. And if it keeps happening over time, it turns into a felony offense. Eventually, part of that show gather up all the people who are enablers and checks them by saying, hey, you got to cut this person off and tell them your uh, bottom lines. You got to set up your boundaries and really mean it. Eventually, the person who is you know, documented thinks they're coming into this uh, hotel or whatever room just to continue the filming. And then next thing you know, reality check. They see all their family members and their loved ones right there. And eventually, that person who's the person who's the addict sits down and listens to everyone pour their hearts out. Like one example, this one guy said, I waited 15 years to have this conversation with you. And he broke down and, and poured his heart out. Another person said, I don't like that you're taking money from my piggy bank. And this is coming from their child. And then, you know, the stories go on and on. Eventually, they ask the question, will you accept the help or not accept the help? If they're willing to accept the help, that's when they go inside a van, go on an airplane, go to this place for mental health resources, away from their normal environment. Eventually, they become a better version of themselves. But again, they have to be willing to do the work. Now, if a person refuses to get the help, well, that's when people tell them, we're going to have to cut you off. We're not going to give you any more money. You're not going to be allowed by my kids, my home, nothing. You come around, we're calling the cops. And that's the reality check. Well, that person can no longer hide from the drugs. They have to make a conscious decision in their actions. And I've seen it so many times where people who have made the um, journey to recovery may have relapsed, but renewed their faith and got back into rehab. There's also AA, AA meetings, alcohol anonymous meetings. There's also people who have life partners who they check on each other. But ultimately, a person has to be willing to do the work because we can look at the farmland of all these crops that the farmer has. In order for those crops to rise up, the farmer did the work through the rain, snow, and with the horses, the buggy sometimes. And that's how life is. We have to be willing to do the work all year round. What do you think about the identity being part of the issue? So going back to being a victor or a victim, you have to identify as a victim to have that mentality. But same with, would you agree that it would be the same with addiction or alcoholism? Going to AA meetings, then you're just establishing and verifying that you're addicted to alcohol instead of just moving on and embodying a new identity of somebody who doesn't drink well that's part of the transformation uh when it comes to alcoholism and drugs you know they made a decision to do that stuff before they actually did the stuff they saw it before they did it it's kind of like someone wants to go to chick-fil-a for food they saw themselves going inside that line whether it's in person, to this, to this checkout, or the drive-thru. Just like with drug and alcoholism, it's just when a person keeps dealing with like these repressed memories that are unresolved, or unlike pain, wounds, and scars, most of that stuff goes back to our childhoods. Whereas somewhere along the line, there was a lacking, either by the parents, or something real bad happened to the child. 
And eventually someone's crying out for help in the worst ways. And eventually a person has to be willing to reveal their pain, reveal their hurt. Because that takes humility to admit that this is the area where you're broken. And this is the area where you need to be healed in. And I've seen plenty of people who made the comeback. Uh, for example, one person can be addicted to drugs and alcoholism. And it's a matter of just understanding what triggered you to want to use that stuff. And once they're able to identify the triggers inside their mind, because the drugs and alcohol was uh, do, it's like a dopamine rush or a feel-good rush that we normally feel like we do like a proud achievement, exercise. Sometimes in life, we had not been taught the right or given the right tools for our own mental wellness. And it's also influence of the people you're around, like the people you be around the most is who you're likely to become. Like if you become around business owners, you're more likely to become a business owner. If you be around people who think like employees, you'll think like employees. And somewhere along the line, you start to outgrow people from those who are thinking like employees to want to start their own business, whether to become an entrepreneur. And some people just realize there's a gap. Just like with drugs and alcoholism, when you be around people who are doing that stuff and get caught up in the court system, eventually you tarnish your name, reputation, legacy, and have all this stuff on your record. And now you close a lot of doors. But I've also seen people open up doors by having people vouch for them. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here because I really want to hear about your car accident. You were in yes. a near fatal car accident. And like I said in the beginning, you had a 1% chance of survival rate. And yet here you are. Could you share in detail what that was like? And when did that happen? Well, let's see. It happened March 19, 2011. I remember the day like it was yesterday, but I don't remember at the same time. I'll give you like a, a sneak peek. Like what I'm about to describe is something. It's like you're there at a party, but you don't remember it. I just use that analogy to say that I was there when the car accident happened, but I don't remember because the injuries I suffered was horrendous. And I talk about it in my book, from the journey of recovery, the journey of being detox of medicines for, for you know medical reasons. It's like, for example, have you ever seen a car accident on a highway? or on the main road in your town and you see the police come, you see the ambulance come, you see the fire trucks come. That's how my car accident was, but my car accident made headlines. My car accident wasn't no average Joe car accident where you can write a police report and go on your life. It's just when that 99% chance of death versus 1% chance of life comes into a factor, that's on the news media, from radio, television, newspapers, social media took a grab of like, wow, there's a chance this guy's not going to make it. And when it happened, the nearest hospital was like nearly 40 minutes away. And I was supposed to die within three to five minutes. So how I was able to like put this together inside my book and visualize it, it took like a lot of strength in me to like, I actually read the newspaper article, look at the television footage, and look at all the social media posts. Like there were people actually praying, saying they're praying for me. And I was just like, wow, this really did happen. And it was a lot of self-discovery for me as well when I was writing my writing this stuff in my book, because I originally was not gonna write about this. What ended up happening several years later while I was going to college during COVID, this Greek family encouraged me to write a book. And the saying is, the keto man's heart's to his stomach. And they kept feeding me lunch because I really wasn't going to do it. 
And eventually I gave in and said yes and got the ball rolling. And part of that self-discovery was just understanding my own truth and understanding like other people's views. Like some people were like bringing up the car accident when I'm at work. I was just hoping when I made my recovery just to like focus on life. But since I was working with student athletes, as adults, you know, whether you're a parent, a guardian, some people want to, you know, research people. Because there's some people in leadership that are not making healthy decisions with our youth. So people like to do their own checks on people. And, you know, when they did background checks on me, I'm talking about parent, guardians. They were just amazed, like, you came from this car accident and you're here working? I said, yes. And it just kept showing up and showing up all the time to the point where I had to tell my boss, it's showing up. And he told me, you're inspiration, Ethan. You have to learn how to deal with it. Hmm. And it's just something I never asked for as far as all this attention, energy, the vibes. Because what people didn't understand was that when I talk about it, it's me opening up my heart all over again, shows humility. It shows I'm being vulnerable with a capital V. But what I didn't understand from people who are looking from the outside in is that you overcame the odds. You became a success story. You became a person who's got a lot of influence to show the kids that they can overcome their own adversities, such as defeating death, or at least overcoming death. And I'll give you like a sneak peek of the book where I talk about that journey of how I say this, rehab, surgeries, and more adversities that happen along the way. Like, for example, when the surgery was done, I was told a woman cried because she thought I died on the operating table. So instead of calling a coroner and declaring me dead, they decided just to sedate me and see if I wake up. And several days later, or maybe a week or two later, I woke up first in a subconscious state, you know, cloud nine on drugs. And eventually, I woke up in a conscious state where I look in the ICU and like, why am I here? And two or three days later, I eventually get told why. And that's the day I was officially declared a walking living miracle. Mm. What? When you walked away from that car accident, did you walk away? Were you able to walk? What injuries did you have? Ooh, let's see. A fractured collarbone, a left black eye. Hurt my wrist. A concussion. That's probably what had me black out and not remember that stuff. The biggest injury of it all was just that seatbelt severed my aorta, which is one of the main art heart valves for blood to go in and out I believe mm -hmm. and I was supposed to die within three to five minutes but it just didn't happen for some reason wow and I mean does is that what gave you a sense of purpose like you knew you had to have known from that moment that you are meant to do something here with this life yeah I remember like it was yesterday like um, when I was underweight on this feeding tube and going back to the golf place. Uh, one of the key things that happened at that place was this guy named Jordan Steffi. He's the founder and board member of his nonprofit organization that was called Two Never Chance Foundation, now rebranded to a Tylo Prep. He was doing his speech. There was supposed to be this keynote speaker to show up, but that person didn't show up because they allegedly missed their flight. And he used to play, he used to play the position of quarterback in Maryland University and back at his high school. And he decided to call it audible. I mean, change up, change up the plan. He's way, using his hand, waving me up to come up. Then he puts his arm around me. He says this speech, whatever. And the key thing that, that, that really like blew the room away and had me look at have had me look at him like this was he said, Ethan's gonna graduate with a college degree. 
I was like looking at him like, how am I going to graduate a college degree when I'm severely underweight? I can barely walk, barely talk. I'm at my lowest point in health. I'm on a feeding tube. And, you know, it just really, like, had the room, like, look at things differently and appreciate life much better for the little things that we take advantage of. And uh, along the way, people were, you know, feeling sorry for me, but they were encouraged. Like, it just wasn't your time to pass away. I remember one person said that. Another person said, you motivate me to become a better version of myself. I got some work to do. And it, it was just, you know, a, sur a surreal moment where somebody was praying that hard. They must have saw a vision for my life many, many years down the road. And eventually, you know, I did graduate with two college degrees. Okay, so you graduated with two college degrees after going through that car accident, after growing up in a single parent, poverty stricken home, and now you've become an author and a motivational speaker and an advocate for mental health. Your platform aims to provide educational resources. What are some key resources or tools that you recommend for individuals navigating their mental health journey? Uh, we have to be aware of our body five senses. What we in invest into ourselves, whether it's with music, the type of food that we're eating, knowing our family history, and being open-minded to healing ourselves independently because they say food is the natural medicine. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, people think fruit punches juice or Hawaiian punches juice. Well, that's the artificial juice. The real juice is taking your fruit and vegetables and putting it inside a juicer. And you'll have the more organic version of juice. Now your body's going to be much stronger. There's that. You have to also be aware of what type of foods are you eating that's non-GMO versus GMO foods. You also have to do some inventory around the people you be around the most because this person helped you become better or worse. Is this person a yes person or will it tell you something that you need to hear even though you might not like it? And it's also, who's going to be, who do you want to be your mentor? Who do you call on when you're going through something? Because sometimes, you know, it takes time to get a, how I say this, sometimes it takes time to make an appointment with a therapist, but also realize, you know, there's also 211, 411 for, you know, talking to somebody if you need some help or someone to talk to. Because you have to have the right people in your circle to want to succeed in life. Because that's what it took for me. Now, my journey's not going to be the same as somebody else's because the area where I'm strong at may be the area where you are not so good at. Like, for example, I had a hard time with college math, but I bridged the gap by asking for help by spending more time with my professor during office hours, meeting with the tutors during normal tutoring out tutor hours, and then also getting a private tutor. So that's three solutions to help me pass my math classes. When it comes to a person's mental health, you know, find yourself a life coach. Find yourself a person that's going to motivate you to become a better version of yourself. And also be around the right people. Because at the end of the day, uh, we have to make the choices count the most for our own, not only for our own selves, but also for others. As far as resources, they're out there. Whether you want to do your counseling online, in person. So there's video chats available where you can do the, the counseling session, just like how we're doing this interview. The only difference is somebody's taking notes versus us, we're just communicating verbally. And you have to be willing to change, be a better version of yourself. I became a better version of myself because I went through the process. And it was a journey, but look where I'm at now. This, but the thing that I want to tell you is that there's still more for me to do and there's still more things to uh, do. Like, for example, I thought by not doing
doing the things that my dad was doing and certain people were doing. That was the end journey, but that's not always the case. And I realized there's still more work for me to do. Like, for example, when it's time for me to have my own family, all the things that weren't done for me, I had to do for my family. And that requires me to step outside my comfort zone and learn from somebody who is, or at least has the qualities of being a productive father, husband, grandfather, and everything else. And, you know, I thank my mentor for that as well. Speaking of what's in front of you and what you still have planned for the future, what are your future plans and your initiatives? Mm -hmm. Jokingly? eat two peanut butter jelly sandwiches. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I uh, finished up the audio version of my book. Um, that was just a long process of me just reading the whole thing myself over and over again, countless times, perfecting it, finding the right person to edit and meet the ACX standards. Uh, hopefully I can make a documentary about my story, eventually make a movie with a soundtrack. Um, in the future, become a homeowner because I realized with the way rent is priced out, I realized a person's better off just owning a home if they qualify to build equity. Because if you're paying $1,200 for rent, you could probably pay between five to $800 for the mortgage if you become a homeowner. Uh, other things in my life, I mean, again, maybe start a family in the future. But it takes the right person, and it starts with me being the right person myself on an individual level and be my own list. Hmm, yes. Is there anything else that you would like to share as we wrap up our time together? Yes. Uh, for people to purchase my book, you can buy it off me directly off my website, ethanspeaks.com. Just send me an email, and we can work out arrangements to have me send it to you through media mail. My book is called The Inspirational Story of Ethan A. Poetic, Chronicles of Adversities, Education, Sports, Resiliency. Yeah, my book's available as a hardcover, softcover. You can pay me through Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, Zelle. And then there's also my audio version that's going to be coming out soon. Same title. The difference is I'm going to put the pre-sale order link with a sneak peek video and a sample video of me reading the book so I can intrigue you, your mind and your influence. And if find me on social media. I am on Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat as Ethan Poetic 23 On Twitter, I'm Ethan V23. Then on LinkedIn I and Facebook, I am Ethan Poetic. And again, my website is ethanspeaks.com. Feel free to contact me for a serious increase on speaking engagements, poetry workshops, life coaching with your mental health or your journey with life. And of course, buy my book because <laughs> it's selling fast and I look forward to making an impact in your life one day at a time, one hour at a time. All of that will be in the description as well. I'm actually really excited about the audio version when that's available. I'm a big audio book listener. And I do have one more question for you. What is your number one health tip? So whether it's mindset, diet, and nutrition, physical, emotional, just the one piece of advice you would like everyone to know. Uh, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Uh, the top good. of one mountain is the bottom of the next. Continue to evolve in life. Because a person's normally not the same as they are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. Because eventually a person on an individual level is still learning more about themselves. And also know your family history. And be around the right people that want to help you evolve. And be involved in your community. And that's it. Such great advice. Thank you so much for your time, Ethan. Definitely, Jessica. That concludes this episode. If this resonated with you, please give it a rating and review. 
And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out on Instagram. I would love to hear from you. Links are in the show notes. I sincerely thank you for your time and your presence.